they have, uh, they have a hierarchical transit service because this is how you trade off, you know, walking to the bus stop is, is that lowest level local bus. You have buses that are slow but, but frequent and, 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 and have good coverage that connect to the higher speed LRT, that, connect, that, that, uh, that have longer stop spaces and, but higher speeds and also higher capacity that connects to the subway, which again is faster, has longer, longer between station stops and so on. The only way you square the circle of, of trying to have both speed and, and accessibility, have, having, having both uh, and, and uh, and, and handling capacity, putting capacity where you need it, and having more capacity where you don't need it, is through a higher article system. And, and this is a huge challenge we face here because we build, we do build transit line by line, and, and, and here we particularly debate it line by line, project by project, and we lose sight of the fact that it has to be part of a network. And, and again, I think this is something the Metrolinx is doing, is doing a good, good job at, is trying to think of, like a network, trying to think about how individual projects can be prioritized so that they can make sense as a project, but they also fit into a network. And if we don't think like a network, we'll end up building a, a set of disparate projects that don't make sense. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, and so we're focusing the debate on you know, what we're going to do with this model totally independent of how it fits into anything is, is just a silly thing to do. Uh, exclusive right-of-way operations are very important, uh, and that's a major way to improve reliability, speed, and so forth. Exclusive right-of-way does not mean putting it in something underground necessarily. That's one way to do it. It doesn't mean putting it up in the air. That's another way of doing it. It also can mean giving them right-of-way on, on, on the street. <coughs> too. I mean, there's only three places you can put things, underground, at grade, or above grade. Each comes with costs and, and, and opportunities. Right, exclusive right-of-way doesn't even necessarily mean rail. It can mean bus rapid transit. And, and also, we don't, it doesn't have to be totally one or the other. There's lots of very successful, uh, particularly LRT systems, that run exclusive right-of-way where they can, and where it becomes just too tough for a, few, for a few blocks, maybe you run on the street in mixed traffic, and it's not necessarily the end of the world. Again, go to Europe, go to Zurich, see what they can do there in terms of mixing, where they have to be pragmatic. Uh, it's just too bloody expensive sometimes to totally make something exclusive right-of-way. Maybe, maybe you, can, you can make some matching. And again, I think part of this is you know, something in our, our political debates. What I pound on the table about is, is this notion that people don't want subways, they want good, reliable service. The, the problem is right now, many people think the only way they can get good, reliable service is by a subway. And part, again, part of our job as professionals, I think, is to be able to explain to people, you know what, we can get you to work on time and faster than, than, than you are now. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to. And maybe we have to put you underground or somewhere to do that, but maybe there's other ways we can do that. It's, it, this is what we should be focusing on, is the good, reliable service, and not arguing over the, te you know, the technology all the time. Again, choice of, that leads to choice of technology. You know, these are the things we should be talking about. <coughs> Speed is important. There's many ways to get this. These are very, very important, and, and, and we, we, to a certain extent, many of our debates, we can outside of both of these things. Tying of the solution to the problem has disconnected, um, and um, and, and uh, we, we have to get past these these ideological debates, these political debates, where where you know it is an act of political faith to say this is the technology we should use. I don't see that. I don't think that happens in any other field. I can't imagine politicians of the left and right arguing over whether chemotherapy or radiation therapy is the way to cure cancer. I don't think anybody would expect a politician to be confident on that decision. Cool. I don't think anybody would, would, would seek votes on favoring chemotherapy over radiation therapy. You know, uh, the good people of Scarborough deserve chemotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're second-class citizens because all they get is radiation therapy. Uh, you know, it's, it's absurd. Uh, and yet we do it here. I mean, my other thing on that is I'm waiting for the mayor of Timmins to announce in the paper that he's going to petition the Prime Minister of Canada that the people of Timmins are good people. They deserve first class air service. Air Canada should fly hourly 747 services into Timmins every day on the day because they need they need good service. Uh, you know, it's nonsensical, right? The cost, the capacity is on the web. And yet, okay. <laughs> we must match capacity to demand. Is the thing, and we know it. I mean, in this room, we know 
that, 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 that you have to manage capacity to demand, that, uh, and that it's, it is a serious, serious issue of benefit costs. And it's not just the capital costs, it's also the operating costs. Okay, so we spend, you know, it's only money. We spend $2 billion more dollars on something we don't need. Ah, let's spend $2 billion on it. That's the capital cost. What's the, what's the lifetime cost of, of, of overbuilding that system in terms of the operating costs? And I know this is something Metrolinx is very concerned about as they're looking at that thing as well. Um, just as a, uh, while we're talking capacity and the issue of streets, we all well know this, that, 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 that transit, where there's the demand, transit can be much more efficient in moving, moving people than cars. And if we take this same, same thing, we often look at the transit the capacity of different transit technologies. Here's the car. One lane of car, one lane, one street lane, at most you, you can get maybe 2,000 people per hour in cars through that lane. And that's being generous to the car. The actual capacity of vehicles is probably more like 1,800 down to 1,500 or so. Uh, so I'm allowing for the fact that maybe there may occasionally be more than one driver in a person in a car. So you know, when we talk about taking a lane for, for transit, if it's a well-designed system, and if the demand is there, that's a really good use of that lane, and you'll get far more people moving along that street than you will with the car. And you know, we, we, we're very poor at being able to explain that to people. Um, short and long run transit plans, it's not just about building big ticket transit. There's all sorts of things we could be doing uh, in the short run, medium term. In addition, while we're trying to build the big subways, the big, the big commuter rail lines, a lot of these are very low cost. A lot of these just require political support, which is also, of course, a difficult thing to get done. Uh, so there's lots we could be doing in the short run. Um, and, and often there's huge benefit cost returns of uh, doing things in the short run. One of which is parking. Parking is probably the sink. I've talked about wait times, walk times, and so on. If we flip around and look at auto drivers, the variable that, is, that they are most sensitive to is parking cost and walking from parking. Uh, traditionally, trip makers are what economists call inelastic. If you make a 1% change in fare or gasoline cost, you get less, much less, much less than a 1% change in ridership. People are fairly you know, stuck with what they're doing. But this is doing that. This is such old technology. This is 30 years. This is something like 30 years ago for the city of Toronto. You know, we didn't really have computers then. Um, uh, what this is showing is what we call arc elasticity. It's almost a one-to-one -one. change. Change parking cost 10%. You get a 10% reduction in auto usage. So the biggest bang in terms of shifting people from cars to transit, assuming transit is there, assuming you know we're in that part of the curve where it's attractive. Is, is, is to restrict parking or charge more for parking. Uh, so this is another policy we should be looking at more aggressively. And you know, something we've tried over time, the big obstacles to this are putting is not technical. Um, and, and, and of course, I don't know how much you've talked about financing today. We've got to play, we've got to break political gridlock somehow. And this is, you know, to a certain extent, the subtext of everything we're talking about here. Uh, I was giving the organizers of this event a bit of a hard time over, over their, uh, they're blurred because they talked about gridlock and how you know we have the worst congestion in the world. And I said, well, maybe we don't quite. And we don't have gridlock. <coughs> we overuse that word all the time. Tra yeah, we have congestion. It's, it's aggravating. But traffic moves. Gridlock is when nothing moves. Well, we don't have traffic gridlock, but we have political gridlock here. We've got to make that change. Okay. This is shovels going into the ground in the current subdivisions look an awful lot like the shovels that are going into the ground in the 60s. I think we're still building the same old way. Our rhetoric is different. We have to turn the rhetoric into action in terms of starting to connect these transit improvements. And again, you know, as I showed in that graph, we're going to have some lost leaders. We're going to have to put transit out there uh, that isn't going to make a lot of money, I think, to begin with. Uh, and, but, but if we use that as a backbone around which we do change, start to change the land use where we can, when we can, as we can, then maybe we can start a dynamic where, where we, we can grow the system. Uh, so desertification is important. So bottom line, wrapping up, um, you know, uh, I think we are in a crisis at the moment, or certainly a turning point. We have two directions <coughs> we can go. We can we 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 can start taking our rhetoric seriously. We can somehow mobilize the politics. We, as professionals, we can start communicating better with people so we can move the yard sticks on this, so that so that maybe, you know, the future maybe looks something like this. If we don't, 
this is a okay. and that's, that's, that's China. That's one of these famous traffic jams in China from a few years ago. Uh, you know, that, this was the 100-day traffic jam or something like that. Uh, but, you know, um, okay, and, uh, it, it, you know, I could spend all day talking about this. Um, colleagues and I wrote a paper a few years ago. We said to have sustainable transportation, we have to have good governance, we have to have good financing, we have to have good infrastructure, we have to have good urban form. Well, right now we're 0 for 4. Okay, so uh, so uh, here at Workway, so we have to start doing better. Um, and I, I always like to end these. This is from Vancouver. This is the Metro Vancouver 2040 transportation plan. And for me, this sums up everything. Again, this is what we should be pounding on in the debate here and trying to change the channel in the debate. It's not about the current taxpayers in Scarborough or Etobicoke or Markham or Mississauga. It's not about the people living there right now. It's about her. And if we start, don't start building a transit system that is worthy of her and her children and her, and their, her children's children, then we have failed totally. And so we have to start thinking about her in all of the debates. And if we start doing that, maybe she'll have a better time. Thank you very much. You, you have to leave fairly shortly, correct? Yes. Now, we do have time, a little bit of time at the end uh, for some questions. Uh, we are a little over time, but with this, while we've got Eric here, I'm going to suggest we take two quick questions. Uh, and uh, I'd like to do more, but I just want to keep the, keep the uh, on, on track as much as possible. Uh, two uh, quick questions, then we'll move on to the next uh, uh, two panelists, and, and then we'll have time for some more questions afterwards. Uh, so we'll two quick questions. Uh, I'll, I'll go to Peter, uh, but if anybody hasn't asked a question, yeah, right. uh, that is, uh, yes, right over there. Professor Miller, have you ever yes. given a presentation like that in a room full of uh, pol politicians and decision makers? <laughs> <laughs> um, Eric, I've seen your talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, it, but not exactly that way. I, I, I spoke to council. I, I was the spokesman for the Shepherd Avenue panel, so I, I was grilled by council for two hours, and that was a bizarre experience because I was in a hotel room in Santiago, Chile at the time, so it was all done by Skype. They actually, they actually had to vote to allow me to testify to council by Skype, but it wasn't this sort of thing. You know, I was answering you know, hard questions about Shepherd Avenue. Uh, well, if there's politicians in the room, I've talked talk to them. No, I've never been asked, let's say, by, by City Hall to come down and talk about this. Another there's question? It. All right, Peter. Uh, another big issue for Toronto right now is the Gardner, the uh, future of that eastern 2.4 kilometers. Do you have, has your institute, or do you have any opinions on that area, on, on that dilemma, tear it down yeah. versus... Uh, <coughs> Well, I guess my first comment, but my first comment is Gardner ties into this because because we've been so inadequate in our transit. If we had better transit, Gardner would be an easy thing to deal with because we'd have capacity. While we're doing whatever we're going to do with Gardner, the Gardner Expressway is going to put tremendous load both on the rest of the road system but the transit system. If we had better transit into the downtown, we'd be better prepared to do something with the Gardner. Um, I don't have a strong position on the Gardner. Um, I'm not a big fan, I mean, I'm obviously not a big road guy, but I'm not a big fan of just tearing it down and not replacing it. For example, I don't think tearing down and not replacing is feasible. I, I mean, I think we have limited capacity into the downtown. I think it's got to be maintained or replaced somehow. I must confess, I've never been a big fan of the Grand Avenue either, in that um, I think people are dreaming in Technicolor if they think like an 8 to 10 lane roadway is an urban feature, uh, you know, is, is, is going to, is going to uh, not be a barrier. Um, uh, and, and there's other barriers, you know, there's railway tracks and so on. And I think the, down, the waterfront has been developing fairly, well, we can debate nicely or not, but I think waterfront development's going, I think it's been an excuse that we have this barrier and that's why we couldn't develop the waterfront. So we spent a lot of money, I mean, my big problem with the gardener, but we're stuck with it, is we're going to spend a lot of money to at best replace capacity. Uh, and, and we're going to have no capacity gain into the downtown globally, but we're going to have to spend billions just to keep where we are. So I, I guess I kind of, kind of come down and let's try to repair and replace as best as possible. Uh, but um, as, as I say, that 